Welcome to episode 64 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Join, as always, my co-host, Mary, a woman who is still upset to this day that she didn't get a pony. I am just Darren, a guy who has been described more as the back end of a horse than the front. Hey, Mary, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing great. Fantastic, fantastic. It is a end of the week, almost, coming around, coming around the bend. So we are looking forward to um, a fantastic weekends here in a few days and looking mm -hmm. forward to a whole bunch of fun stuff so how are you i'm good and you were right about the pony thing horses oh, I, are I, one I, of my favorite animals so there you go how are no you pony for you mayor not <laughs> oh, god ah, no it's been good it's been pretty good it's been it's been a good day it's been fun it's been a um interesting week so um we got some fun today we're going to do the libations yep. here in a second but um, we, you know, what we're going to talk about today, Mara. We changed literally. We changed horses. See what I did there did. after we decided on the on the, the episode. So, as you know, not every Civil War horse is the same type of horse. Of course, of course. So we're going to talk about a whole <laughs> bunch of different types. But before we do, I'm going to ask you a very important question, and that question is, of course, as long it better not be a math question. No, it's what is wrong with you? no? What are you drinking? <laughs> I am drinking. Um, Harvest Ale by Muskoka Brewery, which is, um, it's a pale ale and it's very, very good. Um, it's from brewery, probably about four hours from me. And I am drinking it out of my general mead mug because tonight, uh, one of the horses I'm going to talk about is Old Baldy, who was General Mead's horse. Okay. Well, what are you drinking, Darren? Oh, you actually asked me I this time. I did, because oh, I'm nice. I'm drinking four score beer company it's called can conditioned pub ale it's got abraham lincoln on mary he's the guy with the hat the president we talked right. about yeah. so the dude that was shot in the theater right yeah yeah, yeah you okay. have heard it cool okay yeah and i'm drinking from my run with the winter mug um, nice. by john Rowe. so yeah, i'm gonna represent him again so he's his stuff is so so good you can check him out yep. on his uh his page on red bubble etc etc he actually does some really good tweets too on um mm -hmm. On, on Twitter as well, like some threads about just different, they're almost like battles that battles and events in the civil war that nobody talks about. So that's pretty cool that he's uh, kind of telling people about that stuff too. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and he's Go got on. a Tilden shirt on his uh, red bubble page and Oliver Otis Howard. Well, there's the mention. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Anywho. So today we're going to talk about horses and it's horses and mules, but we're going to focus on the horses today. Um, horses were the lifeblood of both the Union and Confederate armies in the American Civil War. They were used to transport artillery, wagons, supplies, as well as the obvious use by the uh, by both cavalry. So we're going to talk about that and how important they were. The Union used over 3.4 million horses during the Civil War, as well as about 800,000 or so from Missouri and Kentucky. Um, Northern soldier, northern horses were mostly farm animals. They were more geared towards moving supplies and dragon stuff um, than, than really running around. Um, versus the Confederates had about 1.7 million. And southern horses were more bred for racing. They were race yep. horses. And they were better suited for use by the rebel cavalry, which it's no surprise, especially at the beginning of the war, that the Confederate cavalry was so much better because their horses were better. They well, yeah, better, that, um, that, and because the, the men who were riding the horses, they were their own horses. So they already had that kind of relationship or bond. Like you need to have that with the horse in order to make it effective. Um, at least that, that's just my opinion on it from, from what I've read, whereas, you know, union cavalry had their horses supplied to them. So they didn't always have that bond with them. Um, but you know, Confederate cavalry are bringing the horses that they've had for sometimes quite a few years. So they know mm -hmm. the horse and rider know each other quite well. And they know kind of the, like, mm -hmm. just the, you know, different characteristics that the, the horse might have. So there's just that, that's definitely why they were more effective. I think. Well, I think they can certainly all notice they read each other's minds, but certainly after a while, it's like, a, it's like having a pet dog for a while. You know, exactly what the you know, the routines are and you know exactly mm -hmm. what's expected of you. But, um, you know, we'll talk about this, how care of these horses, you know, for something that was so important as a horse, um, care was pretty mediocre at best. I mean, people care mm -hmm. for people was not good, let alone horses. No. Uh, veterinarians for the most part were non-existent. Um, the Union Army only had six vets in the entire army. I mean, that, that's, ain't gonna that's do it, crazy. Right? You know, um, so the soldiers were left to care for these animals by themselves. They had to provide horseshoes. They had to provide blankets. They had to provide any kind of care their horse would need. Feeding horses was an endless problem. 
You oh know? my God. They needed, so, um, like, what was it? 14 pounds of grain a day pounds, and 10 pounds four, of hay was what was recommended. And you had to have the right. supply trains to carry that as well. But the generals, though, didn't see the importance of this. William T. Sherman, you've heard of him. He took that long walk to the beach in Georgia, ended up in Savannah that time. Yeah. Right? His dating profile He's, says enjoys long walks. He does. He does. Um, <laughs> he said every opportunity at a halt during a march was used to cut grass, wheat or oats and extraordinary care should be taken of the horses upon uh, which everything depends. So the generals knew it. They understood. Now, early in the war, we, you know, we mentioned care was not good. Mm -hmm. It was pretty awful. There were 250,000 Union horses that were kept in dirty stables all around Washington, D.C. Um, they were underfed. They had little or no care. They weren't groomed. Um, none of them could talk at all. No. So they had not to even Mr. Dead. They had to just take it and just, you know, move on from it. You know, the Rebs, you know, to your point, the Rebs had to they supply their own horses and they need to supply their own horses. If you were in the Confederate cavalry and your horse was injured or killed, you have to get a new one on your own. So mm -hmm. if you couldn't afford one and they were going for like a hundred, 150 bucks a pop back then, which is a lot of yep. money, chances are you're going to get transferred to the infantry from the cavalry, which is yep. significantly more dangerous and a lot more walking. So you wanted to make sure they took care of these horses. So when you see these, these thieves stealing horses and, and raiding things that, that was, that was, they were gold. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing that I learned about the, you know, kind of the Southern Cavalry in this, and, and I just thought of this now too, um, you know, I think this goes back to the difference, differences between North and South. North is a more industry-based economy. You're not going to have that kind of bond or connection with, with the animals, right? Whereas in the South, you know, horseback riding was probably a pastime because the economy slave-based, unfortunately, you don't have to go to work. Right. But there's that kind of, I don't know. I think it's a difference between North, North and South. But the one thing that I did learn um, in doing the research for this was that sometimes, especially on the Southern side of things, um, the cavalry would, um, when they recognized that their horses were tired, they would get off their horses and they would walk them to give mm -hmm. their backs a rest. Yeah, no, there's no question. And so as the war went on, you know, jumping, not stay on schedule with this, but by 1864, these armies had been all over the place at this point. So a lot of the places they would stop to camp were basically barren, right? Mm -hmm. The supplies, yeah. um, the supplies had to, be, had to be brought into the camps at this point, in a lot of cases, a lot of times those supplies were raided or stolen. By, by raiders uh, union or cavalry and those horse rations we mentioned which is about 25 you know 25 pounds a day of hay or grain yeah that was cut down to less than five pounds a day it's so you know, that, sad that's the equivalent of maybe having a couple of almonds all day to eat as a human yeah and i mean and, the soldiers are going through the same thing and you think back to that and we're you know, you think back to that scene in Lincoln where um Lee goes to surrender to Grant and they have traveler in that scene the the horse traveler was you could see his ribs in that scene i remember that he looked very emaciated and that was uh -huh. to i think portray just the state of things you know even the uh -huh. horses are starving and you know, the one thing about this is like you know the cavalry when when they stopped um i remember reading this about nathan bedford forrest he always told his men you look after your horses first because uh -huh. that's your mode of transportation oh that, that was everything i mean it was the Think about jeeps today's military boats exactly. in the navy your horses yep. this was it now um the other thing the other side of the coin is the water a horse mm -hmm. needs four to nine gallons of water per day which is why most of these battles took place along waterways yep. right because they had to camp they had to find a place not only to, to water their own men and have water to cool down their weapons like like the artillery but you know nine gallons a day is a lot when you think about some of these horses and some of these battles right now the problem, you know, with the, going into battles real quick with this is, is the you know, we, you look at, you know, human care, the triage system had just kind yep. of started care for horses and battles was, was forget it. Okay. Despite how important these horses were, um, they were the, the union and the Confederates were so bad at tending to injuries of these horses when they happened. So it was just surprising because how important they were. They were literally the lifeblood of their armies. Yeah. So when you look at how important they were to the battles, we don't realize how important they are. A, an artillery piece, one gun with a case on and the limber requires 14 horses to move them. Yep. 14, okay? And 
the artillery horses were gods. They were they were not ridden, oh, and they had the hardest job because they right. they were right there in the thick of it, you know. And and those were what the sharpshooters in either side would try and take out. You, if you take out their horses, you are mm -hmm. taking away their ability to move those artillery. And the thing about it is the sharpshooters got very good at that. So yep. it, 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 they say a thousand pound horse, it takes between five and seven mini balls to take one down. Okay. Yep. But as time went on, as a war went on, soldiers with really good shots could kill a horse with far less. And we saw that. Ream Station, Battle of Petersburg, Winfield yep. Scott Hancock, his, his last you know real battle that he mm -hmm. had. Um, in August of 1864, there were troops from the 10th Massachusetts Battery. They took zero casualties, okay? In the first five minutes of that battle, they lost 30 horses. Oh, my God. That, that's a show what, what, the, what the priority of targeting was yeah. at the beginning of these battles. The first goal you did was take out the horses. Once you took out the horses, then you could go take the care of the people. And yeah. then you went and got the guns. That's how it worked. So you think about that. The 10th mass, not a single one. And then, then you end up with 30 horses in five minutes. And gone. that's a huge loss because then you've got to go oh. back to Washington and say, like, I've lost this many horses and they've got to get those horses to you so you can move your artillery. Right. That That is going on unless like the Confederates have moved it and fucking taking them from you, right? No, but I mean, but as, as the war went on, care for these horses began to take on it's such an increasing importance yeah. for that reason. And so they realized they had to start to find a way to take care of these horses. So both the North and the South begin to build infirmaries to care them in, mm -hmm. kind of like mini horse hospitals. You know, the yep. little nurses, the whole deal of you know, ponies walk around. You know, they have the whole thing, right? <laughs> and little, so, I just pictured like a little pony, like one of those mini horses dressed up like a nurse. You mean like a little <laughs> brony? Yeah, brony. God. <laughs> Going to look after like old Baldy who's in a bed all because he got wounded again. Okay, anyway. Oh, God. <laughs> but but the thing about it though is that the doctors for the most part had zero equestrian medical knowledge. Yeah. They didn't know what the hell it was. So so um so if you had if you were a doomed horse or had a serious injury, you you were kind of you know wasn't too too it, it was pretty good. Well, so some of these horses overcame some pretty horrific injuries, which well, well, which we're gonna talk about that later on in the episode. Well, it's true, but what happened was is just like just like people, they can get in, they can get disease, and that was a big part yeah. of this too. So when horses got diseases, it spread amongst the herd faster than it takes for you to give me the finger on an average day. That's how quickly <laughs> these things went, right? So one disease that was really bad was a disease called glanders, mm -hmm. okay? Glanders was, a, was it spread to the horse population very, very quick in both armies. It was caused by crappy water is really what it was, okay? Um, they would drink this, this contaminated crappy water and the horses got sick. It was extremely contagious. It got into the horse's lungs and it really affected their breathing. One of the final symptoms before a horse would die is it would discharge this really this yellowy nasal discharge crap oh, out God. of its nose, right? Mm -hmm. And that was usually the last final symptom before the horse, the horse would die. So infected animals with this, they had to be taken down because how fast it spread. So there were two Confederate physicians, a guy named John J. Terrell and John R. Page. They're the ones who actually discovered the source of this disease was the water. And so what they did is they provided clean water and they gave more ventilation. It really cut down that disease of this glanders, especially in the Confederate wow. Army for a while until a con. But the other problem you had is when the horses died is mm -hmm. what to do with them, right? I mean, there was no glue factories back then. So you had to find <laughs> oh, something to do with them, right? So disposing of dead horses was a real problem in a gigantic dare I say, Herculean task, right? Yeah. Uh, especially on the battlefield. Now, you remember in, um, all those pictures that Matthew Brady took at Gettysburg? After yeah. 1860? Okay. So all those dead horses everywhere, um, they started to emerge and, and just show the carnage wasn't just limited to men. Yeah. And people started to see these dead horses everywhere. So at the Battle of Gettysburg, there were 40,000 horses, okay? And it was an estimated that there were 3,000 killed at the Battle of Gettysburg, right? To deal with these dead horses, there were these special horse burial detail things that were created. Uh, and we're going to talk about Meade's army because the Confederates had gone and it was the Union that was left to yeah. deal with all the stuff, right? So they created these, these horse burial details to dispose of these thousands of dead horses that littered the entire battlefield. You can only imagine how awful that must have been, right? Their first task was to cut off the stiff legs. 
Yeah. That was the first task. It'd stick right up in the air, right? And then what they would have to do is they have to drag these thousand pound carcasses into these large holes and cover them with soil. No, you couldn't really imagine how long this must have taken, right? And in now, that heat, it's July in the heat too. It's it's hot and, and they're worried about disease and everything that's going on with that. So um, they realized it was, it was, this was taking way too freaking long to do. So they decided what they had to do because of the stench and the fear of, of disease, they had to burn them, right? Yeah. So what they would do is they put these gigantic piles of horses and light them on fire. And they would have, the citizens of Gettysburg would help. Confederate prisoners were forced to do it. One local Gettysburg resident said the odor from the burning horse flesh smelled like an escape from a hateful charnel house. Okay. So, oh my God. I know there was one, um, sorry, I got to mention again, Howard in his memoirs, he wrote after one battle. Um, I, I can't remember if it's Eastern or Western theater, but just seeing the horses and then piled up and then burning and the smell was just something that would like never leave him, you know, no, like you, he always remembered what that was like seeing these poor animals and what they'd been through. If you want to have learn a really gruesome, painfully detailed story of this part of the Battle of Gettysburg, you can actually take a tour. There's a place off Steinway Avenue that you can actually take this post aftermath tour and they tell you all about this. It's, it's awful. Um, but many, you know, Many of these horses, finally, they was left behind to rot. They just, just couldn't deal with them yeah. anymore, right? Lydia Leister, her house was used as, as, as Meade's headquarters over there on yep. Tandytown Road, right? She had 17 dead horses that remained on her property after the army left, okay? And most of them appear in Brady's pictures. You can see the pictures, yep. right? And these 17 horses took two years to rot. Two years they sat in her yard, okay? Oh, my God. And when they did finally vanish, the skin... She had 750 pounds of horse bones piled up in her yard. Two years, okay? Now, the injured horses at Gettysburg, the injured ones, okay, um, those that were not injured too, too badly were the last to receive care, right? Yeah. The ones that, just like people. I mean, it's a triage thing for the mm -hmm. most part. And those horses were taken to those horse, horse hospitals, horse doctors, whatever the hell you want to call them, these temporary vet hospitals, yeah. right? Those that were mortally wounded, unfortunately, were destroyed one shot to the head. That's that's what happened to them. I hate mm -hmm. to say it. Um, there were some soldiers who actually chose to stay behind and help the horses um, for, instead of leaving with the, with the army. Private Hezediah Weeks, no relation. Wow. He, he, <laughs> that's he, so he, cool. He was, a, he was a blacksmith from Baltimore, Maryland, a regiment called the Patops, Patopsco yeah. Guards, right? In he stayed behind after the battle to help tend to these injured horses. He would assist them in feeding and putting bandages on them. He was just, he liked horses, wanted to stay behind and help the horses. Now, these horses belonged to the army, and the army didn't forget that. So when they were brought back to good health, they would be returned to service. That mm -hmm. was kind of how it worked, because these, these things were a premium. If they were, if they were okay but unserved to fit. They would either well if they were if they were if they were unserved or fit and they weren't okay they'd be destroyed if they were okay but they just couldn't serve anymore for whatever reason um, they were actually sold to the citizens of Gettysburg. Yep, that that's what happened. So some citizens who took care of the injured horses tried to adopt them themselves without permission. They were promptly arrested by the army for horse thieving stealing horses. So anyway, that would be me. Um, I would be like, hey, come live at my house. But God, you imagine but these, <laughs> hor these horse pen things they created to, for these injured horses were set up, you know, for the army really to evaluate the status of yeah. these horses. So they would put, keep them together and kind of judge how it was and to see if the horse's recovery to make that determination of what the horse's ultimate fate was. Those deemed unrecoverable, which after Gettysburg, there were hundreds um, were destroyed, right? There were over a hundred horses that were herded to a thicket by the Spangler farm and shot in the head. And their horse skeletons remain on that site for about 20 years, the Spangler Farm in Gettysburg, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's a sad, sad story, you know? Yeah. Many, many though were recoverable. I mean, they were okay. By mid-August 1863, ads started to appear in the local newspapers for horse sales of these wounded horses at Gettysburg. So you can pick up the newspaper and see there was an ad that said, Quartermaster Smith advertises the sale of 350 condemned U.S. horses at Gettysburg on Monday instant. Sale to be day-to-day, -day, the terms U.S. cash only. So 
these rescues, which is what really what they were, would end up working on the farms um, where the battle took place. A lot of yeah. times they'd be pulling plows, they'd discover horse bodies, human mm. bodies, all kinds of stuff. So at the end of the day, if you really think about it, these poor horses really were the real innocent victims of this war, right? And we, we talked we talked before about all the dead horses and dying horses at the peach orchard, right? Yeah. When we talk about Barksdale and how many there were and how sad it was for these Confederates. E.P. Alexander talks about in his diary about how yep. sad it was to see these horses looking up mortally wounded with these sad looks in their faces like, like, what are you doing? Well, they had, and, they didn't have a choice. Right. And like, they're, they're, yeah. they're kind of like these unsung heroes. And I know Sherman writes about it. You know, there was one time where he went, he wrote a couple sentences about the men that died in this one particular battle. And then he wrote for a paragraph and a half to his wife about the suffering of the horses, you know, so these men are affected by the deaths of these animals. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they're the same people, especially the Confederates. When yep. they had these horses from, from when they were young or when they got and they really had, had a strong bond with them of, of watching these horses killed. I mean, some of these, we talk about people like Nathan Bedford Forrest had 30 horses shot from under him. Yep. Now, I'm not sure how relationship he had with these horses, but <laughs> you, can you can imagine, talk about Claiborne with Dixie, right? That was his favorite horse. And he, he didn't like horses, but Dixie was his favorite horse. And, he, and Dixie was shot out from under him at Perryville. He wasn't just shot from under him. He was exploded. It's exploded. Yeah. He got hit with an artillery and literally just exploded. And Claiborne was thrown off the horse and walked away with just an injury to his ankle. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, as we start to talk about some of these, um, these generals, there's some really, I don't say there's a lot of famous horses. There's a whole bunch of famous horses throughout the civil war. And a lot of them have some really, really cool names. Um, and we've kind of picked out a couple to talk about, which is kind of some of our favorite stories about some of the horses. So, yeah. um, so I'll let you, I'll let you kick this one off. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to start us off with, um, Stonewall Jackson's horse, which I'm sure everybody has heard of little Sorrel before. Um, and little Sorrel's little Sorrel story is quite, it, it's an interesting one. So May, 1861 Harper's Ferry. Um, Stonewall Jackson seizes six train cars. One of them is carrying horses for the Union Army. And from these horses, Jackson ends up purchasing two. A large one for himself, which he apparently called Big Sorrel, who was this beautiful black stallion, and a smaller one he named Fancy, um, who was actually not really fancy. He was kind of shaggy and unruly, which he intended for his wife, Anna. Well, as it turned out, Big Sorrel was a little bit of a fucking spaz and spazzy horses and battles don't mix very well. And that was the problem with some of these kind of these thoroughbred horses is, you know, they heard the cannons and stuff and they would just completely freak out, especially early on in the civil war. And we've talked about that in a few of our episodes before. Um, and Jackson needed a horse that had kind of his level of Zen in battle that was able to cope with the noises of the guns, artillery, the shouting, and just the general chaos that goes with these battles. So he decides to try Fancy, which oddly enough, Fancy is also the name of one of um, General John Reynolds' horses. Um, and Fancy was the horse that he had intended for his wife, Anna. So upon, upon riding uh, Fancy, Jackson remarked that being on him was like being rocked in the cradle and that he had a smooth pace and even temper, quite the opposite of the horse that he had been on before. So Jackson ends up changing Fancy's name to Little Sorrel. And this becomes, you know, one of the more famous Civil War, like general and horse, you know, and Little Sorrel was almost an extension of Jackson's personality. You know, he's a little bit weird. And so was Jackson, right? Um, and it's going to become Little Sorrel is going to become Jackson's primary horse until he's wounded at Chancellorsville on May the 2nd, 1863, and then dies on May 10th, 1863. Um, so Little Sorrel, um, just to give a bit of background, was a Morgan horse. And Morgan horses were originally bred in Connecticut. And um, they the first one was said to have been born around 1850 on the farm of Noah C. Collins in Summers, Connecticut. And you know, every Morgan horse is said to have been a descendant from this, this one sire. And 
So these horses are known for their short legs, their stocky bodies, which is how little Sora looked. If you look at pictures, that's how he looks. And they are also, um, they're very Zen. They're ideal battle horses. They don't freak out at cannon fire. They don't freak out at loud noises. And they're also known for their endurance, their quick quickness and their agility. Now it's funny, um, you know, when Jackson chooses this horse early in the civil war, the union army eventually by 1863 is exclusively wants to exclusively deal with these Morgan horses because they figured out that these are the ideal battle horses just because of their, their endurance. They can go for like long, like they can go for a long time before they need rest. Jackson had one, you know, for quite a while in the civil war. Um, and during breaks in battle, when Jackson was not on little Sorrel, little Sorrel would lay down and have a nap middle of the battle, just lay down. Um, kid Douglas, a member of Jackson's staff had this to say about little Sorrel. He was a remarkable little horse. Such endurance have I never seen in a horse before. We had no horse at headquarters that could match him. And I never saw him show a sign of fatigue. Sounds kind of like, you know, in a way, actually, I was just going to say, that doesn't sound like Jackson because Jackson liked to nap, but then again, so does Little Sorrel. Well, it's funny because you know Jackson, he was you know Little Sorrel was, was Little Sorrel. He was little, so yeah. They talked about how the soldiers would laugh at Jackson because he'd have to you know he'd have to ride with his he'd have to pull his stirrups all the way up to his chin. He'd have to ride like a jockey. Yeah. With his horse, and it must have been hilarious. Now the thing about Sorrel is Little Sorrel, you know, kind of you know kind of like Charles Tilton, he got caught twice by the Union. He was, it was captured two times. Well, he did. Right? Yeah. You know? He, he and, was. Oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, so he, he kind of had the, he kind of had quite the a little adventure with, with Stone, Stonewall. Oh, he did. And like Sorrel could cover 40 miles in one day and Jackson was so comfortable on him. He would often sleep during these marches and the Jackson Sorrel duel would make soldiers rally and it would boost morale. And this is so similar to what we saw with Cedar Creek with uh, Sheridan and Rienzi. Mm-hmm. the sight of them, the two of them, the two of them almost became, you know, together. And just like Jackson Sorrel, this is kind of the, the equivalent to the Rienzi Sheridan that we see in the union army. Mm-hmm. And the ironic thing was that Jackson didn't like the cheering and was actually embarrassed by it. And little Sorrel seemed to, to know this. And it was said that whenever the Confederates raised loud and friendly noise, the horse would break into a gallop and carry Jackson speedily along. So he knew to just kind of get Jackson away from that situation. Um, and little Sorrel and Jackson were in many battles together. Um, Manassas was one of the first ones that they were in together. Second Manassas, uh, Kernstown, McDowell, Fort Royal, Winchester, Cross Keys, Port Republic, Cedar Mountain, Harper's Ferry, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Seven Days, and finally Chancellorsville in May of 1863 was their final battle together. And this is where, as we know, General Jackson is wounded by friendly fire on May the 2nd, and he ends up having his left arm amputated, and he succumbs to pneumonia on May the 10th. And when Jackson was shot, this was said to have been, you know, one of two times that little Sorrel bolted away from him. And they end up finding him, some Union soldiers end up finding him and under flag of truce, they bring him back. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they knew it was Jackson's little Sorrel. Maybe by that point, the reputation had kind of, you know, carried on. Um, And they, they brought him back. And... It was Jeb Stewart who gave little Sorrel to Jackson's wife, Anna, Mm -hmm. and she continued to look after him. And he, it's funny. He was a bit of a trickster. Um, like she took him to live on her farm that she, she was on and he, there was other horses there and he would sometimes open the gate. He figured out how to undo the latch. He was really, really intelligent. That's the thing with how horses, they're very intelligent creatures. And he and all the other horses would get out and they would kind of like run around and stuff. Um, He went to a lot of like veterans um, events. They took him there Uh to things like that. Um, And he was very well known in the civil war and after the civil war. And he actually ended up at um, one of the veterans homes 
and the veterans were able to go see him and, and visit him. And it was really probably a good thing for them to be able to see Jackson's horse, little Sorrel. And he lived to be quite an old age. Yeah. I mean, Sorrel, Sorrel, obviously, you know, he was a rock star after the war, um, you know, even in the North and the South yep. in Somerville in, um, in Summers, Connecticut, there's a little Sorrel Lane you can go on and visit yep. in Connecticut. Right now you mentioned how he was famous, you know, as he got older, he, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people would come want to sit on sorrel and because it's Jackson's yeah. horse, but, but as he got older, they had to have this sling thing to keep him up. They did. Right. Yeah. And what happened? Yeah. You know? One day they put him in the sling and the sling broke and he broke his hip. Yeah. That and the beginning of the end right there. Yeah. And he ends up passing away. And it was the, you know, it was veterans that were looking after him at that point. And he was actually, this is, he lived at the Confederate soldiers home in Richmond called Robert E. Lee camp. And he was a pet absolutely adored by the veterans. And that that's where this, you know, the sling accident happened and his final hours were not spent alone. He was cared for by the, by the veterans. And one in particular stayed by his side of old veteran named Tom O'Connell stood by his side during the day and night and slept beside his charge. And this is what, like the guy said, he said, until he went over the green fields of some animal heaven to rest in peace and honor. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Or perhaps he found Jackson on the other side of the river. Maybe. Probably a persimmon tree, probably. There you are. Get me down. <laughs> he jumps on Little Sorrel's back. So after the, the death, Little Sorrel's body was given to the taxidermist Frederick Weber and mounted over plastic. And Weber kept Little Sorrel's bones as part of payment, but he later donated them to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this actually angered a lot of Southerners. And so you can view Little Sorrel today at VMI and his bones are actually buried at the foot of the, the statue that's there. And Little Sorrel's legacy continues to live today. He's almost as famous as Lee's Traveler um, and as you said, he's got a street named after him in Summers, Connecticut. And there's also a few statues showing Stonewall Jackson and Little Sorrel together, including the, you know, pumped up on steroids statue as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, little, little, the, I mean, yeah, he's, 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 yeah, you're right. You're right. I think as much as people talk about, about Lee and travel, we're not going to go into the whole traveler story. Everyone knows that story, but, but yeah. it's, it's just, um, He's one I think that's it's it's certainly beloved, you know. He outlived his outlived his master, obviously. Yep, yep. And there's a few horses that outlive their masters for sure. But yeah, little Sora lived to be quite an age for a horse. He was probably, I think he was around eleven the time that Jackson got him. And he would have been well into his thirties by the time he had the sling accident, which is really sad. You know, but he just couldn't stand up and veterans wanted to see him. The other thing they would do too is they would pluck his hairs out of his tail when he was at oh. fairs and stuff back when they could actually take him to fairs, but he got to the point where he could only be in a stable. Yeah. Well, certainly had a hell of a run, Mary. He did. And I think you've got a horse story for us next, don't you? Oh, okay. absolutely. We could talk about our old friend, Turner Ashby. Remember him? We talked about him at Kernstown. So real quick, we'll talk yeah. about his background a little bit in case, in case you know who he is, but Known as the Knight of the Valley from Farquhar, Virginia, he's born in 1828, the son of a War of 1812 vet and the grandson of a Revolutionary War veteran. Before the war, he had founded a group called the Mountain Rangers in road to Harpers Ferry, where John Brown, that raid was going on. Um, he always said that the war started then. It didn't, wasn't Sumter, it was, it was John Brown's raid. That was when it started, according to him. And when the war did start, he was part of Stonewall Jackson's militia, probably hung out with little sorrel who knows <laughs> the, uh, the outbreak of the, so he was he did a lot of jackson's reconnaissance for him um especially during the valley campaign um he was not a supporter of secession but he decided to stay loyal to virginia because and he formed company a of the seventh virginia cavalry which he eventually commanded by 1862 the seventh cavalry of virginia was enormous it had 27 companies had the reputation of being wild and out of control as you can imagine um, it must have bothered Stonewall. I have to imagine he probably didn't appreciate that. <laughs> Ashby's hatred for the North grew and grew and grew. If you remember, especially when his brother Richard was killed and bayoneted by a bunch of Union soldiers. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, his horse, 
was named Tom Telegraph, Mary. That was his name, Tom Telegraph, right? That's an amazing name. <laughs> right? It was. And, <laughs> and he, he was a white horse, okay? His horse is one that, um, that was noticed and admired by many, including their enemies in the Union. And you mentioned before about how these horses had these, you know, they, they, these guys had these horses for years, and they just knew each other, exactly what each other was yep. going to do. This was one of them. One Union soldier, the Union guy, he writes, Ashby's horse was disciplined like his master to the accomplishment of the most wonderful feats. He will drop to the ground in a flash at the wish of a rider and rise again as suddenly bound through the woods like he would bound through the woods like a deer, jumping fences with perfect ease, they said. On April 17th, 1862, at the first Battle of Kernstown um, and the first Battle of Winchester, a Union cavalry charge against Ashby led to some serious hard hand-to-hand combat. Old Tom Telegraph, that's his name. And <laughs> oh, <Telegraph. laughs> he would, was during this battle, he's going to be shot in the side, the horse, okay? And blood is going to come pouring out of him. It's going to hit him right in the ribs. He still, with Ashby on his back, is going to get Ashby out. So he's going to run and jump fences full speed as blood is gushing out of him. And he's going to do this as soon as they get to safety. Ashby gets off the horse to check on him. The horse collapses from lack of blood, and he's dying. Um, Ashby, upon the death of the horse, um, he's going to set. He's going to start petting the horse's mane. He's just sitting there, just they talk about the emotion of it, of him just taking care of his dying horse. Mm-hmm. And one of the troopers who watched this horse die with Ashby, you know, massaging his mane, says, "Thus, the most splendid horseman I ever knew lost the most beautiful war horse I ever saw." Ashby himself would join old Tom Telegraph in death not too long or less than two months later when he was shot and killed with the 13 Pennsylvania Bucktails in um, the Battle of Goods Farm in Harrisburg, Virginia. Although some say it was friendly fire, who the hell knows? But in either case, that's how he went down. Um, What's interesting was as he was killed, the horse, I mean, um, somebody cut off his hoof. They cut it off. And the hoof, if you're interested, Mary, is still is on display at the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond. Someone took off of it, and what happened was there was a, um, there was a, uh, like a, like a, a druggist, a drugstore guy, ended up with the horse, ended up with the with the hoof, and on the on the hoof, you can go to look at today. There's a handwritten note on the hoof, okay, and it says Turner Ashby's white horse horse's hoof shot and killed in a few hours near Newmarket, Virginia, on Valley Pike. Wow. And then next, right, and then next to it, there's a there's a hand drawn picture. And it's on Henkel Dr- Henkel's Drugstore letterhead. So that's who it was. It was like a sticker in the corner. It's Henkel's Drugstore, right? And it's a hand-drawn picture of Ashby riding the horse wearing a cape and a big plumed hat and the words under it, Night of the Valley. Oh, so, that's so cool. So it's pretty cool. So if you're in the area and you have, want to go check it out, you can go to the, the old um, Ironworks over there, the site of the Army, the Confederacy Museum, to go check that out. So I thought it was a cool story, not as long as yours, but it's interesting <laughs> that it really shows the parallel about how they kind of shared the same mind at times. Yep. And how the horse knew, had, I have to think the horse knew it was dying, still had the wherewithal to get his master up, got the hell, because he just took off. And then as soon as he was safe and he jumped off, he just collapsed and gave up and died. As his, as as Ashby's rubbing him, you know, talking mm-hmm. to him as he's dying. So and it, I guess it was quite an emotional scene to see because as I mentioned, some one of the soldiers wrote about it. And that just goes to show the relationship that the horse and the, the master had for each other in these cases. Absolutely. There there is a very strong bond in in some cases between these two horses. And I actually, before I go into our our next story. Um, I have a quote from a union officer um, named, his name was William A, or no, actually Confederate Army, William A. Brown. Um, He said, my little bay horse had his hind leg nearly torn off by a piece of shell that seemed to burst six feet in front of my face. At the order to retire, I remounted him and his last act of service was to carry me out of danger. As the faithful animal stood there bleeding and shivering in pain and I powerless to help him in return, I could not prevent the unmanly moisture in my eyes. And when we drove off and left him, I could not have felt it more keenly had I been leaving a wounded human friend. So these guys, especially in the Confederate army, not to discount the, the, the soldiers and the relationship that their generals had with them and the men had with them in the Union army, but the Confederate army, there is especially strong bond, especially early in the war, because these are animals. Some of them have had since they were boys. And when they lose them, 
they really do feel it. And when you're in the cavalry, you have to have a horse that, you know, that you can read that and that can read you. And the generals had primary mounts, and I'm sure the cavalry had their primary mounts too. You know, mm-hmm. Lee's primary mount was Traveler. His secondary was, I think, Lucy Long. Um, and Sherman had Sam and Duke, and I recently found out one named Lexington as well. And Grant had his primary mounts and his secondary mounts and all that. But well, they all, you, know, you, you have a you have a mount that um, and I'm going to tell a kind of a funny story in my next one about Mead, about what happens when you're not on your primary mount mm-hmm. and, and what can happen. Oh, it, it's it's during a battle. So, so why don't you give me one more good story? One all more. right. Make make make. Oh, you're frozen. No, oh, you were frozen for a second. <laughs> kind of worried me there. You were like frozen for a second. Well, we'll watch the YouTube video and see if you're frozen. <laughs> As I was saying. Anyway, okay. So our next story is Old Baldy, General Meade's horse. Um, so Baldy was a bright bay horse. So kind of, kind of rusty reddish color. And he had a white face and he's got kind of just a bit of white of just above each hoof. So he begins his civil war career at the first battle of bull run as the horse of major general hunter. And he was probably about six years old at this point, the horse, not general hunter. That would be fucking weird. General hunter was six years old. (laughs) Um, And so he was wounded at first bull run. And this is going to be the first of many times that Baldy is wounded during the civil war. He's wounded up to 14 times during his Civil War career. So the horse obviously survives, but he never goes back to General Hunter. Meade ends up buying the horse for $150, and because of the horse's white face, Meade calls him Old Baldy or just Baldy. Now, it's funny. Soon after Meade gets this horse, he writes his wife, and he's like, yeah, well, I don't have the greatest horses in the world. Like basically Hunter broke this one I'm on now, Baldy. So the relationship didn't really start off the greatest. He's kind of reluctant, but he still spends $150 to buy him. Uh Um, But then Meade starts to become quite attached to him. Baldy becomes his primary mount during the Civil War. Um, The staff wasn't too fond of the horse though, because he had a very strange pace and he was hard to keep up with. So his walk was a little bit faster than the average horse's walk. So they had to get their horses to go a little bit faster to keep up with him. And Baldy and Meade are in many different battles together. They're in Drainsville in December of 1861, which is a Union victory, seven days, second Manassas, where Baldy ends up badly wounded in his right leg, South Mountain, and Antietam. At Antietam, he's wounded in the neck, He's left for dead, but later found grazing, you know, just, he's got this neck wound and he's grazing. So he's such a, like, you almost like me. He's very resilient. He just, he's like, oh, I'm just going to eat some grass and wait for someone to come look after me. And someone did care for him. And he, he comes back for Fredericksburg and he's at Chancellorsville as well. So on June the 28th, 1863, Meade is given commander or given Meade is given command of the Army of the Potomac just days before the Battle of Gettysburg is fought. So July the 2nd, 1863, a bullet passes through Meade's right pant leg and into Baldy's stomach. And for the first time ever, according to Meade, Baldy refuses to move forward. And Meade said, Baldy is done for this time. This is the first time his he has refused to go forward under fire. Immediately. Meade has to dismount and get a different horse. So Meade is actually quite worried about this, about Baldy. And he writes to his wife on July the 5th, Baldy was shot again. And I feel fear he will not get over it. So clearly Meade at this point on July the 5th, after the battle has happened, does not know what Baldy's fate is going to be. On July the 8th, he writes his wife, old Baldy is still living and apparently doing well. The ball passed within half an inch of, of my right thigh and it passed through the saddle and entered Baldy's stomach. I did not think he could live, but the old fellow has such a wonderful tenacity of life that I hope he will. So you can see kind of this bond that they have together that Bede wants him to live because this is his primary mount. Uh The primary mounts are are 
you know, the general and the horse know each other very well. And it was in 1864 that Meade decides to, tire, to retire Baldy. And during the Overland campaign, Baldy was struck in the ribs by a shell at the Weldon Railroad. And it was after this that Meade took him out of service. He wrote his wife on April the 21st, or he wrote his wife on April the 24th. Yesterday, I sent my orderly with old Baldy to Philadelphia. He will never be fit again for hard service. And I thought he was entirely to better care than he could be given on the march. So Meade is, you know, Meade's recognizing this horse has been through hell with me uh -huh. and it's time to just let him rest. So he lives in a farm outside Philadelphia and then eventually moved to a place called Metal Bank Farm where he, he lives there for several years. And Meade maintains a close relationship with Baldy after the Civil War. And one source describes them as being absolutely inseparable. Um, when he was still fighting in the Civil War, Meade would often ask about Baldy in letters to his wife. He, he said, where is he and how is he getting on? And on July 7th, he wrote, 1864, he wrote to his wife, Mar Marguerite, I'm glad to hear the good news about Baldy, as I am very much attached to the old brute. Meade would ride him in several Civil War memorial parades. And the other thing they did, too, is they would often go riding together around Philadelphia. And when Meade passes away, Baldy is still alive. And on his, during his funeral, Baldy is the riderless horse that is in the funeral procession and baldy passes away a few years after that he they actually have to put him down with poison sadly um but and this is the creepy part of the story it's kind of godfatherish they they bury him and then they dig up his body and they cut off his head and his head became part of the old old baldy round table you can still see it. it's mounted on a plaque it's it's really fucking creepy but you can still see it um the one thing that Mead and baldy did though is they went riding together so sometimes Mead and baldy would ride around philadelphia together with with Mead's daughters and sometimes they would go off on their own and just ride in the countryside and i think that was a a, like a thing for Mead as much as it was baldy the shared experience of going through something so horrific that need could go be with him and just ride and kind of forget about that. It's like getting together with your soldier buddies. I think some of these generals, the horses that survived the war, they would go just ride them because they'd had that shared experience that nobody else got. And the horses knew them so well at that point. Like you think about it, how many hours are you spending on that horse? How many hours did need spend on Baldy? And it, like that is like Mead and Baldy is my absolute favorite Civil War horse story. Um, just that relationship, how it started off rather reluctantly. Mead's writing to, to his wife saying, well, he's kind of been broken by Hunter, but you know what, I'll take him. And oh yeah, I just spent 150 bucks on him. It's like, dude, you probably like him if you're spending 150 bucks on him, right? Um, to, to this one where he's like, I, I'm quite attached to the old brute. But the funny Mead story I have to tell is actually about July the 2nd at Gettysburg. And it has to do with Pleasanton. And Mead's got to ride out to the peach orchard and he doesn't have a mount. And Pleasanton's like, oh, you can take mine. And the one thing they don't do is they don't talk horse. Calvary horses are very different from the horses the generals ride. The, the cavalry guys have very different means of dealing with their horses so they don't that they don't bolt. Um, and anyway, so Mead is out there talking to Sickles and the artillery starts going. And Mead goes to kind of rein in Pleasanton's horse the same way he would Baldy. Well, Pleasanton's horse ends up just fucking bolting with Mead on it. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's, he's getting right for the Confederate line. Like he's going right for the Confederate lines. Mm -hmm. He was, a, you know, he was, he was a double agent horse, Mary. He was. <laughs> but I just thought that was like as bad. Like, it's like, that's really risky for Bede, but that is just so funny because he went to do the same thing he would have done for Baldy. And the horse just like fucking bolts. And it was something to do with the type, like just the type of harness they would have on the horse. Mm -hmm that it was a little bit different uh, between what the cavalry would, between what Pleasanton would, was using and what Meade was accustomed to with, with Baldy and how they would hold the reins and how they would start to rein them in. And anyway, this horse just fucking bolted. And I thought that was a great example of how like the, when you think, you know, the horse, 
and Mead's on a different horse and he doesn't know it. Probably he's not even thinking he's having to deal with sickles, <laughs> you know, what he's done. And he's on a different horse. And I just, I thought that was a really funny story about. Well, you, you, know. you find, you find your horse and you just love it. I mean, you, you look yeah. at Joe Hooker had his horse lookout, right? That he yeah. got, that he ended up getting a Chattanooga and he named after that famous battle. He adored well, that horse. Yeah, 17 and hand, a big horse. And was, that horse, you can actually see a statue of him in, in the city hall in Boston, Mary. Mm -hmm. Up here, you can see old Joe Hooker on uh, on his horse. And some of these some of these guys had great names. I mean, obviously, George McClellan had a horse in Kentucky. I'm going to guess yep. was not a speed horse. Probably never won the <laughs> Kentucky Derby. Um, he also had a horse, a black horse named Bums. So I don't know what that's all about. It's, you know, ooh, ooh, but, okay. Um, Benjamin <laughs> Butler had a horse called Old Almond Eye. That's what, he, that's what he called wow. it. So, so there was a whole bunch of ones. Phil Carney, obviously, you know, he had a bunch. You know, he had Moscow, and then he had um, he had Decatur, then he had Bayard, and they all. So they, Bayard was the one that he was killed on. Yeah, Chantilly. I'm trying to make it. You know, he didn't make he it. He got savannahed. Hard. Okay, he certainly <laughs> did. At least all his problems are behind him. You know, <laughs> but I mean, but it, the point is, you see these guys, and they find their horse. They have that kinship with, right? Yeah. You know, we mentioned Lee with Traveler, and uh, I guess old Lucy too, for that matter. You know, Jeb Stewart had Virginia, right? And all these famous horses that they all tend to ride. Um, it, it was that it was that comfort. Now Grant's had about a thousand horses, right? Oh my God! And his his favorite ended up being Cincinnati. Who Cincinnati was given to him after the Battle of Chattanooga. And it's funny, Cincinnati was the son of the fastest thoroughbred at the mm -hmm. time in the US called Lexington. Mm -hmm. And one thing I found out recently was that General Sherman was given the brother of Cincinnati. So also the son of Lexington. And Sherman called mm -hmm. him Lexington. And this was the horse that um, the, the source I heard, he rode into Atlanta. Oh, cool. But he also had... He had uh, Rondi and he had Kangaroo and he had yep. Fox and he had Jeff Davis. Jeff had, Davis. Uh, there was a few horses that Confederate horse Union had, that called their horses Jeff Davis. Yeah, he had a horse named Jack at one point too, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so he might have had a horse with no name. Who would call that band, Mary? <laughs> Who knows, right? Um, well, but Mead wrote, had wrote, one right? called Mead's secondary horse was called Blackie. Mm -hmm. well, there's a whole bunch of good ones. You know, it, it's a lot of fun. Blackjack had, had Slasher. Yeah, you know, Logan. Albert Sidney so, yeah. Johnson had uh, Fire Eater. Mm -hmm. there, there was some, there was some good ones. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. Johnson was ahead of his time with Fire Eater. That should have been Barksdale's horse. I know. Right. Yeah, right. And she apparently, was. Fire Eater was called that because he would just like he would get so like it was not just you know what the word Fire Eater means, but he would just get mm -hmm. so riled up in battle that he would go forth, and that's that's the horse that. Uh, Johnson was riding when he was killed and apparently the men like the, the horse had to be put down yeah. after the battle and the men had a tough time picking who was going to go do it because they knew how attached mm -hmm. Johnson had been to that horse and of, and of course William Bates I have to enunciate this his horse was named Black Hawk so again so we have to uh, thank think you about that. So. for not making me do that one that would have been a disaster <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it's it's fun to talk about these because I think horses are as much as how important they were. And like we said at the beginning of this, they were the true lifeblood of both armies. I don't think they're really under, I think they're very appreciated. They're very underappreciated. They are the, they're like, they're the unsung heroes of the civil war. There was three. Oh my God. I, I said that. That's exactly what I said. Yes. Wow. The unsung heroes, but they really, they really were though. And you know, and when, when a real, you know, when a, an, a Turner Ashby or one of these guys loses their horse, it is a gigantic, gigantic emotional experience, especially one that you've had, your, you know, for years and you really trust it. It's, it's like losing a you know, family member. And that's exactly what it was. Yeah. And so, um, but again, there were different types of horses. There's, there's the war horses, there's the dragon horses, there's the cavalry horses, whatever it is, they, um, you know, they all, there was many types and many types and, you know, over 5 million total horses, the American Civil War combined, um, but fifty percent casualties. Yeah, right. They lost that, that many. So you think of how many horses um, were put down and were killed in battle. So or died of disease as well. Like they were yeah, the, yeah. the horses were taken from the same things that the the men were, be it a wound in battle or a disease or like just starvation as well. You know, it was like in without the horses there's no way that this you know 
that either army could have moved anywhere. They needed the horses to move the artillery. They needed the horses to move the supplies and they needed the horses as well to move the wounded. You think of how many horses there were on Meade's retreat from Gettysburg moving those ambulances. Uh-huh. You know, as yep. you said, the horses are the lifeblood of the army. And I mean, people remember them. People remember Traveler and I think they know Cincinnati and they know Rienzi and they probably know Little Sorrel, but it's all these horses that are, you know, we don't know their names and, and maybe they didn't have names, but that are the lifeblood of the army. They certainly were. They certainly were. So it's fun to talk about these things. It's about, yeah. you know, I don't really hear about these horses all that much. It's fun to sit down, you know, talk about the, the horses, but also talk about the fate of the horses and how they had a real, real tough time mm-hmm. and, and appreciate. So when you see these horse statues, like the one you're picture here behind you yeah you fort riley kansas video. is where um, this is from you know they were they were they were just as important if not more important if it wasn't for the horses who knows how the world would have turned out and that's that's not hyperbole that that's that's fact not fiction yeah you know that that's a, that's a real deal so what's coming down the pike for us mayor so after this episode drops on november 13th we are taking the next week off so oh, yes. november 20th we will not be releasing an episode but we will back be back with you on november 27th so after thanksgiving um with the battle uh that takes place before franklin which i can never remember the name of spring, spring hills. hills spring hills okay oh my God. <laughs> there's too many battles of springs in them or hills <laughs> that's why you're the best you know but then we're gonna, have, we're gonna have we're gonna have a, a okay we're gonna have a live um and i will be in whereabouts unknown as i travel around the country again yeah um, so we'll be, I'll be taking my show on the road again mm-hmm. poor little mayor's gonna be stuck in her little house and that's yep. okay but some someday we'll get her out so anyway so i think that's a good thing so we have a lot of fun stuff coming down the pike so um i think this is a fun one to do as well so yep. any uh any final words from you there fincheru anything exciting going on uh, that you want to get off your chest no, not at all. I think this is a great episode to do. Um, I think we should dedicate it to all the horses in the Civil War. Hit my glass. Yeah, there we go. Uh-huh. All the, all the mil- like literally mil- it was millions of horses that were needed in the Civil War. And just that the stories are really, really interesting. You can find the names of the horses online. The generals had some really creative names for them. And it's really cool to finally be able to talk about some of these horses. Um, and you know, just and also the overview that we gave at the beginning. So uh, thank you for bringing it as always for this. Hey, just, just happy part of the team. <laughs> God. Anyway, so off we go. So um, have a great night. I appreciate everybody listening to another episode of this. We appreciate it. We're on, on to episode 65, which we're yep. episode 100 is on the horizon. Mary. It is. Thinking about the big 100th episode extravaganza yep. here that'll take place in, I don't know, 30 Whenever. weeks. Whenever. I don't know. I'm not going to do the math on that and figure it out. That's less than a year. So we'll be ready to go. Yep. All right. So again, everyone have a great night. Have a great weekend. I look forward to you, uh, talking to you on the other side. See you all later. Peace out. Bye. Do 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 do